All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to this session of the Youth Veterinarian Initiative, excuse me, YVI. I am Dr. Monique Y. Wells. I am coming to you direct from Paris, France. And unfortunately today, my partner, my partner in crime, quote unquote, Sharita Herring Oglesby, who would normally be hosting this um, session is not able to join us today from her, her spread in um, Hattieville, Arkansas, Oglesby Acres. So I'm going to do this um, episode alone. Um, I am thrilled to welcome to YVI Dr. Stephanie Jones. She is coming to us from uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and she is the co-owner of the Animal Hospital of Fort Lauderdale. Um, one of the reasons that I'm really upset that um, Sharita is not able to join us today is because Dr. Jones is also from Arkansas. And she, I know that she and Sharita were gonna have a lot to talk about with regard to Oglesby Acres and what we're planning to do there for our summer camp. Um, but just briefly to tell you about Dr. Jones, she received her <clears throat> bachelor's degree from Texas A&M and I am from Houston, Texas, so yay, Texas. Um, and she received her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of Florida. Um, she is a passionate about reproductive medicine, soft tissue surgery, and she is an emergency animal, emergency medicine veterinarian as well. Dr. Jones does a lot of work with the human animal bond and I wanna talk with her about that today. Um, and she's also going to be doing a walkthrough of her clinic and telling us all about how she came to love veterinary medicine and get into the field. So without further ado, go ahead and take it away, Dr. Stephanie Jones. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Animal Hospital of Fort Lauderdale. And just like I was told, my name is Dr. Stephanie Jones and I'm a small animal veterinarian. So I work primarily with dogs and cats. I've been in practice for 23 years and I've been at this hospital for 22 of my 23 years. And we can talk about that a little bit later. So one of the things that I wanted to do was just welcome you and introduce you to my hospital and just talk about the whole process from the moment you purchase your pet and then you're ready to go to your veterinarian and see all the ins and outs of what it is that we do. I'm sure a lot of you have heard in terms of what the veterinarian actually does, but have you really been behind the scenes to see what's involved, starting honestly from the front desk, working your way all the way through to the back? So that's what we're going to do today. And then after the tour, I have a couple of friends that were dropped off and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the benefits of the human animal bond and how that led me to starting my nonprofit, Pets Help the Heart Heal. So it all comes into play from the moment I was 10 years old. And that's when I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. And it started with a teacher investing in me and just showing me what it is a veterinarian does. And so that's what I'm going to do today. So this right here is our lobby. And what happens when you first walk through the door? So you're coming in with your pet and right here at this, what we call the front desk, this is where the receptionist or now called client service representative would greet you. And they're the first people that you come in contact with. You're gonna introduce yourself. You're gonna introduce your pet. You're gonna say, this is your appointment and what time. And then they're gonna get you checked in. And so then you would just sit in the lobby and wait for the next person to come and get you and bring you into an exam room. And that person that would come and get you is usually either a veterinary nurse or veterinary technician or a veterinary assistant, which is also someone that works with the technician and the doctor. So there might be someone that would come in and greet you, say hello, say hello to your pet, and then escort you into an exam room. And so that's where we're gonna go next. So right here in our hospital, I have six exam rooms. So during a busy day, then all of them may be full. And so you may have to wait a little bit until a room is available for your appointment, but be patient because they will get to you. 
So once you do, you're going to be escorted into the room. This is where the big information comes. This is where your veterinary technician will get what's called a history from you. And that would be why you're here. Whether it be just an annual checkup, meaning that your pet, your dog, your cat, your rabbit, your ferret is here for an annual checkup and vaccines, or whether or not your pet may be sick or not feeling well. And one of the things that I say about veterinarians is that we are like detectives because at the end of the day, our pets, they can't tell us what's wrong. So we have to rely on clues to help figure it out. And we have to rely on the information that you as the pet owner gives us so that we can put all the pieces of the puzzle together to help figure out what it is that could be wrong with your pet. Now, sometimes we can't figure it out, but there are definitely some tools and resources that we have in our place that can help assist us in that. And so then I always tell students, I say, veterinarians work off of four of the five senses. And then I just ask like, what are those five senses? So we have sight, touch, hearing, smell, but the one thing I will never do is taste anything. <laughs> so I work off of those four and, and that's what helps me. That's what helps me to figure out what is wrong with your pet when they come in. And so in here, we are a what's called paper light practice. So most of our um, information is entered into a computer. So the patient record, everything that's done in the past, all of those things will come up on the computer screen. And then we can just enter in our information as it comes to us. So then I might ask, well, tell me what's going on or how long has it been going on? Or when did you notice it? Is it a lump? Did it get big? Did it get big fast? Those are the questions that may ask. we may ask. What does it look like? What did it smell like? Those types of things. And then when I do my comprehensive physical exam, I do it the exact same way every time. Because if we go in and just look at a pet and based off of what it was that you just told us, we might miss something. So I always start at the head and work my way down to the tail. And I'll use all the different things that are in the exam room. I'll use my stethoscope. I'll use an otoscope to listen, to look into the ears. I'll use an ophthalmoscope to look into the eyes. And I love veterinary medicine because it's very similar to human medicine. So all of the things that you may see when you go to your doctor, we're gonna check that out as well because we have those exact same things in veterinary medicine. So we're here in the exam room, we're getting our history, we're coming up with a plan. So that plan is gonna be what other test do I need in order to help figure out what's going on with your pet if they come in sick? Or it might be your pet is completely healthy and happy and all I need to do is give some vaccines and prescribe medication to keep your pet healthy and happy. So that's the exam room. So that's what happens in here. So then if I do prescribe something, or if I need to write a prescription, then we will head into pharmacy. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look into our pharmacy and what we call pharmacy and testing area. Okay. Remember, just like in veterinary medicine or in human medicine, we have a lot of tools and things. And the best thing about veterinary medicine is that a lot of the times in the animal hospitals, there are some things that can be done what we call in-house or right away, because there are times when I need that information right now, because it could be very, very important and very critical. Other Dr. times- Dr. Jones, just, let, me, let me just ask you something. Let me just ask you something. Well, let me ask Devin something. Devin, can you come off mute for a minute and tell me and tell us whether you have pets right now and whether you've experienced anything like what Dr. Jones is talking about. Absolutely. No, I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't, no, I haven't really. You don't have Do you pets? have a pet? Yes, I have four pets. What do you have? I have a Rottweiler, a Maltese Poodle, a snake, and an alligator snapping turtle. Oh my gosh. Okay. And so then do your parents, do you take your pets to the vet? 
Yes. And does that vet do all of it or do you have to go to two different veterinarians, like one for the dog or one for your snapping turtle, I think is what you said? Um, I actually don't know because either one, I, I listen, but then I get defocused on something else or, okay. uh, or I'm not in the room when it when they talk about it right so then a lot of times at some animal hospitals the client actually has to stay in the in the exam room right mm -hmm. have you been in there and that's pretty much it so once again so as we continue to go back here you haven't seen the things that are back here right no yeah so that's what makes it a little bit more interesting in terms of what's going on back there <laughs> so we can see what it is all right all right, so you have a Rottweiler, right? Yes, ma'am. And how old? She's like three. Three. Okay, so she's young. And so for the most part, she's pretty healthy, right? Happy. So then for her, if she were here, then we would just be doing a routine checkup and making sure that she has all the vaccines that she needs for your area, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. So then I would have to come back here into the pharmacy area and the testing area. And I would actually pull up our vaccines. So we do have our vaccines back here. And we also have medications here. So there's some medications that I do have in the hospital. And then there's some where just like with people, you have to write a script for it. But so here we have all our different medications, our heartworm prevention, our flea control, all those things that you would need to help take good care of your Rottweiler. And that's what I would do. So I would prescribe that from here. Our vaccines, they have to be refrigerated. So we have our refrigeration over here and that's where the vaccines would be. So that's what's happening back here. So then that's one area of our hospital. And then as we continue to move down, which we'll head this way, so when you come in for those vaccines and everything, one of the other things is that we're testing for potential parasites. So you may have to bring in, your vet may say, hey, when you come, can you bring in a fecal sample or stool sample? And so then we have a microscope here so that we can look and see if there's anything in, in there that needs to be treated. So we have that, we have our microscope over here. And then we have all of our other testings, testing area, which would be back this way. He's gonna pan and show you the microscope. So here's our microscope right here. So then we can see everything. What are you looking for when you look, <clears throat> when you look at the stool sample? What are you looking for? We're looking for what are called eggs. So parasite eggs or worm eggs. So there are certain worm eggs that will float and we are able to see under the microscope. And especially when we have like kittens and puppies, it's very important to get that test because they're the ones that usually, especially stray kittens and things of that nature, they're the ones that usually will have those types of worms. And so those are the things that we can see here. Also, if I'm doing my exam and I notice that there's something in the ears, then I can also get a sample of that and look at that in the microscope as well. So the microscope can give you a lot of information from your pet. Excuse me? There, go ahead. Uh, how will you get the ones that don't float? Ooh, so when, so we have some that we can see on the microscope. There are some that we can see visually. So that's called tapeworms. So you may say there's something crazy attached to my dog's hair that potentially looks like short white rice. And so that one I'd be like, okay, that's a tapeworm. Then there's another way where I can take that same stool sample and send it to the lab and they can run specific tests that may not see the actual eggs, but they can see an enzyme in the stool that'll let me know that that parasite or that worm is there. So they're actually vision, right? We're using our senses and then other testing as well. All right, so we're moving on. Great question. And now we are gonna go over to this area. This 
is our blood testing area. So we can actually remember, I was like, if I need information right now, then I can run tests in house to see that. And so what test could I do? I can do a blood test to look at what's called your red cells, your white cells. So your blood cells. And then white cells are used to help fight infection or inflammation. So they can give me information as well. And I can also run tests that actually tells me what the organs are doing, what the liver's doing, what the pancreas is doing, what the kidneys are doing. So if I need that information immediately, I can run it off of here. And so that'll give us a lot of information, which is really, really important, especially if the dog or cat or snake or whatever comes in super sick, because sometimes we have to act pretty quickly. We have to be on our toes, be able to think on our feet in order to diagnose the problem. So that's what we would do here. Do you have any questions for me? No, ma'am. Okay. I, I have so, a question. I have yes. a question, <laughs> Dr. Jones. So let's just say that Devin brought his turtle in. His what? His turtle. The turtle? I don't know. We'll see what I can do because I don't <laughs> see turtles, but go ahead. Okay, right. You did say at the beginning that you treat dogs and cats, right? Okay. Yes. But so, but you have an emergency practice. You have an emergency practice. Yes. We will see emergencies during hours and I will see more like reproductive emergencies like C-sections. Okay. Um, so, but we have emergency hospitals that are open 24 seven, uh -huh. but you can have an emergency even during the day. So sure. we are capable of dealing with that. Absolutely. Okay. But if you don't normally treat turtles and snakes and someone comes in with one, what do you do? So if it's something that I'm totally not familiar with, then I, I will, I would refer them to the exotic veterinarian who's literally around the corner. Okay. Um, so I can do that. Okay. Um, or that client service representative or receptionist, if they already communicate that it is a turtle, we would advise them to go because you don't want to get into something that you're not comfortable with, especially if it's an emergent situation. Mm -hmm. You had some owners and actually my, um, one of my partners who's a retired veterinarian, she did see birds in the beginning. And when I first got out of vet school, we did see skunks. Oh, so I had to then do some research, do some studying, um, familiarize myself with at least the most common um, issues that skunks would get. But most of the times they just came in for the physical exam and the vaccines that they needed. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe once I did do a spay. Um, but yes, it was a big fad about 20 so years, 20 years ago. To have and so, skunks. yeah, so that was interesting. So I did some, you know, and there are times, and it also depends on, you know, how involved you want to be, because at the end of the day, the, the science behind it may be the same. You just may have to use some different references, like what is the normal red blood cell count in a turtle? Mm -hmm. What is the normal white blood cell count? You know, what are the most common diseases that, the, that those particular animals can get? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's also about educating. So I would completely be honest with you and tell you, that that is not something that I work on all the time. And then we can make decisions as to what's best for them. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. you, you wait, you said you used to work on birds. I used to, I used to have like at least five birds. I didn't, and, my partner did. She would work on uh, them. The most that I would assist in is like the beak trims and the nail trims. Yeah, we would have some, they can be mean. <laughs> Were your birds good? Yes, but uh, yeah. they died. So, some of them died. Yeah. But they live a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had like over 30, 30 year old birds that would come in. Wow. All right. Okay, so we've done our testing mm -hmm. and we're finding information that we potentially may need. But what if I need more testing to be done because I still haven't quite figured out what's wrong with my patient? So one of the other things that we do or again, can be done in an animal hospital are x-rays. And so we're moving on to the x-ray room. And what I love, like I said, we are 
paperless. So 20 years ago, you would have to take x-rays and you'd get the film and you'd have to dip them into these different solutions and then let them dry like in the dark rooms when you would take pictures. And so then, and then you'd have to wait and then you'd have to put them on what's called a viewfinder. But then technology advanced and you probably like, what in the world? So now we can take digital x-rays and they upload directly into the um, computer. Okay. So we'll come in here. And I actually, so I have an example of an x-ray. So this is the machine that we would use. And then I'm gonna show you, just so you see. Mm -hmm. So in here, so we have radioactive waves and beings that will come to help take the picture. But you can't just be in here because of that radiation. So we have to wear the proper equipment and attire to do that. So I'm gonna have my intern, who's my videographer today. Okay. We're gonna to show you some of the stuff. All right. Hello. <laughs> this is Andre. Hi, Andre. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> so Andre's a college student. He was one of my mentees when I did, I mentored um, teenagers from my church. Uh -huh. And so I kind of voluntold and I said, hey, <laughs> you can get some experience. And he's actually pretty intrigued. Actually, the time that I mentored him, he had never been to the hospital. So he's learning some things about the animal hospital as well, because he had a pet. Okay. So now he knows what happens behind the scenes. So now this is our drape. Is it heavy? Yep. Yeah. So there's lead here. So that actually protects him and all of his organs from the radioactive beings or the radiation beings that potentially they're called scatter that would happen as they're taking their picture. Mm -hmm. So we have this. And then we also have the neck guard mm -hmm. because you also have some glands in here called the thyroid gland. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be as fully protected as possible. And then for our technicians, they also have badges that will measure the amount of radiation so that we don't have them taking so many pictures that it could make them sick. Mm -hmm. So this is the proper gear that you would wear when you were in x-ray to take the pictures. And it's pretty oh, heavy. Yeah. And then they also have um, lead gloves. So if you have that dog or that cat, or that might be really, really mean, and you still need to hold on to them, so you want that. And it's also to protect you so that your, pick, your fingers and your hands don't get into the x-ray when you're taking the picture. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what if, like, I heard, like, it has, like, some, like, magnetic, where it brings, like, magnetic stuff up during the x-ray. Like, what if a dog had, like, recently swallowed something of metal? So we're going to go over here and take a look. Let's see if we can get this to work. I may have to turn off the light, too, yeah. just so we can see. I don't know. Can you, if we go this way, you may or may not. Now it it's all it's, it's, it's all really, white. Yeah, it's all white. Um, yeah, it's bright. This is pretty cool. I was going to show you, but you're absolutely yeah, right. It's white. Yeah, it's all white. Um, you're absolutely right in terms of metal. So metal, when you look at X-rays, same thing about those beams that I was telling you about. So there, are things that light up what we would call bone density or what's called soft tissue, like your skin density, and so bone density will be white, and so would metal. I know, right? He's like, look here. Um, and so that is what we would see. And you could see it distinctly. So BB guns, those types of things, yes, you would be able to see them and they would be bright, bright white. And then your, your bones are also white. And then the other things like your kidneys and your liver and things of like that nature, those would be a different, different color pattern. Now this one, I was trying to show you because it's what I do. This one was an X-ray of puppies. So inside you can see, cause I need to, when I'm either planning on helping with delivery or planning a C-section, I like to know how many puppies are in there 
just so that I know how many I'm getting out when I'm done, that type of thing. And so this one, um, there are, and I can look at, you can actually see the skeleton, the head and the bone of the skull. And so there are actually one, two, three, four puppies in this x-ray and you can see those things. Mm. Or if there were um, say a sock, a rock, rocks we'll see x-rays of just recently, um, yesterday or two days ago, a dog got a um, steak bone. And so he ate the steak bone. So I could see the bone pieces in the x-ray, but then it made him constipated. Mm. So that was a whole mess in and of itself. But we could see it. And those are good things where you know there's a starting point and a stopping point. So for veterinarians, that's easier because you know when you're done, right? When we take these puppies out, we know what we're done. When we see that all the bone fragments are gone and all the feces has moved out and the dog has pooped it all out, we know we're done. Mm -hmm. Or he's still not right, take another x-ray and you can be like, yep, there's still a piece there. What can we do to help move it along? So those are really good. Tumors, if there's a tumor on the spleen or something like that, we can see that. If there are issues with the bladder and there are what are called bladder stones, we can see that because- what is a, Go ahead. What, what is a bladder stone? Ooh, let me see if I can find, I will show it to you because I'm sure I have some here. Bladder stones are rocks that are produced in your bladder. And so that happens. And have you, you've heard of kidney stones and people, right? Have you heard of kidney stones? So kidney stones are up higher in the kidneys. So these are true rocks that are in the bladder of a dog or a cat. And they can present, a person would bring them in because maybe they're peeing all over the place, right? Or they've noticed blood in the urine and they're like, what's wrong with my dog? What's wrong with my cat? That happened yesterday. And sure enough, we got a urine sample. We ran it on our in-house test because I wanted that information immediately. Saw something, then actually went over to use that microscope that we also talked about. And we were able to see the crystals. So then I was like, all right, let me take an x-ray because I want to make sure that there's not the actual rock in the bladder that's contributing to blood in the urine. And that's how the whole cycle and everything that we just talked about came into play. I also got one more question. Sure. How do they form? So very good questions. And it just depends. So each patient is different, but most of the times it's about the amount of water that the dog would consume. The diet plays a big part in it. And not to say that, oh my God, your dog was eating bad dog food. It's just the way that they process the food. So it can change the dynamics of the bladder and then help that stone to form. So it's not one particular thing. Genetics can also play. There's some breed of dogs that are more prone to getting those stones. So it's a different thing. So if I did find one and it is one that technically I can do prescribe some things to help either dissolve that stone or prevent more from forming, then that's what I would do. So then there's like food that could potentially help that. And so that's what I would educate to my client. Thank All right, you. you're very welcome. So we see that there are babies here or we could even stay on the stone process. So now we say that there is a stone there and I normally have a picture and I wish I could think of a client, but you can't see that tree anyway. So I'll, I'll find one for you. And so then we're gonna move, yep. And now say we did have that bladder stone because I like that one. And we see that there's a huge rock, like a rock. And they honestly look like that. Almost like a rock that you would find outside. They're like, they can be all shapes and sizes. They can be smooth or jagged. And so we would basically need to sometimes go to surgery and remove that. So where's that? Where does that happen? So back here, This is our, are you coming? My dog's here. <laughs> your screen keeps freezing for me on my side. Yeah, your, 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 your internet connection is um, 
a little wobbly, uh, Dr. Jones. Well, I hope she hasn't gone completely now. Because it says she only had one bar when she went to the Only one bar? Mm -hmm. oh, no. Me? You're, you're breaking up badly. Perhaps. Where, hold on. Let's, let's open the door. Is that, can you see us? Now we can. Yeah. So I may have to keep. Oh, you know what we could do? We're going to keep. You're frozen. We can't hear you. Is this a good spot? It's better. Mm -hmm. It's better. Yes. Yeah, you're you're moving slowly, but we can hear you. Huh. I'm right under and plugs in and everything. Hold on one second. Is it better? Yes. Yes. Right here? Mm -hmm. Okay. I may not be able to go into the treatment area. Okay. Or, outside. huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we could go as long as the signal stays. I can, I have a clear window so you guys can see, but they won't be able to hear me. Oh, we can go and I can stay right here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to just pivot a little bit and we'll see if our signal stays okay. Okay. But our treatment area is where we would house our patients until it is time for surgery. So when they're back there, they are getting vitals in terms of heart rates, body temperature, they're getting pre-medded. So they're getting everything pre prepared on fluids, catheter, everything that's needed to be ready to go to surgery. And then also back there is where we would do our hospital cases. And so those are the ones that are just waiting for either additional tests or the actual treatments that need to be done once we figure out what the problem is. Yeah. So that's what would happen back there. Okay. Okay. Good. All right, so we're going to, I think we're going to see if we can at least keep our signal and I'll be able to talk to you guys about surgery from the window. Okay. Can you, can you see everything? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stand here. All right, beautiful. So in here, that's our surgery suite. Mm -hmm. We have two of them. Mm -hmm. So that if we needed to, if we have a surgery day and we were going to go from room to room to room to room, that is very, very helpful in order to keep the day going. But in here you can see, and it does look like now when you watch TV and you'll see their surgery areas, you'll see that ours is very similar to what you see on Grey's Anatomy or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And so, and we have all of the equipment. So we have our anesthesia machine. And we have our warming devices. So there's a warming device. So we make sure that our patients are warm while they're under anesthesia. We have our EKG and blood pressure machines. We have our IV fluid pumps and machines. So we have everything that we need. And then you would actually have your surgical nurse that would be in the room with the doctor so that they can get them all of the supplies that they need when they need it. And then they can monitor the patient and let me know because I'm in here trying to, you know, find the problem, fix the problem, but then they'll, they're the first line of defense. So they're going to let me know, did the blood pressure drop? Did the heart rate drop? And then we'll have to prescribe things to help stabilize the patient. Mm -hmm. And then my favorite thing in here is called the laser. So, you know, in TV, you'll see the, the doctors use a scalpel blade. Mm -hmm. And what we have here is called a laser CO2 laser. So it's actually a wand 
and it will cut and cauterize at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it leads for less bleeding mm -hmm. and less tissue manipulation. I love it. I don't even know how to do surgery without it. Really? <laughs> uh, uh, does so that's it all of the things that are done. Huh? Does it consist of gamma rays? The CO2, you know, I don't know. I don't know, but that's a good question. I don't think so though, because there is a, um, like when I think for brain surgery and things, and that's only because I see it on television. I think the like the gamma rays and things like that, that cut in those glioblastomas and things. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. But ours isn't like that. All right. All right. So then that is pretty much the animal hospital. We have ultrasound. I was going to show it to you, but I don't want to lose the signal again. Mm -hmm. um, so I can do ultrasounds. I use it mainly for the reproduction so I can listen to the heartbeats of the um, pregnant dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. um, I can use it to, once again, the light's kind of bad. Um, I can use it to see about getting the urine from the bladder. I can use it to see, heaven forbid, if there is any fluid in the belly, I can see that. I can look at it to see the organ, the kidney. You're breaking up. The liver. Ending up again. Okay, we're moving. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Yes, ma'am. I've been seeing this area. So that's pretty much what happens at an animal hospital all the way from the front and finishing up in the back with surgery and treatment. Fantastic. And that's pretty much what I do every day. Fantastic. <laughs> also, I like your dog. Thank you. Did you see him? I was going to bring yeah, him he here. Wa he, he walked by? He, yeah, he walked by a couple times. Let me see. Max? Max? And I also have one other treat. So one of my client service representatives, um, she came in today on her day off because her mom found some kittens. Oh. So they're kittens that are about, we, we guesstimate based off of the weight of the kitten that they're about three, three weeks old. Okay. Me, All right. So here we're going to show you. This is Max. Hi, Max. Good Hello, boy. Max. Looks like he, can, he looks like he can be in beauty pageant. He looks like what? He can, he can be in a beauty pageant. I know. He's so good. And so he goes with me, tie in. So he goes with me to the schools and I go to foster care organizations to promote the human animal bond. And so you can 100% know that your pets, don't they bring you joy and happiness? Yes. Especially well, when, well, especially well, when well. you've had a hard day. And I'm sure that Rottweiler, how big is that Rottweiler? Like, at least like in this car from yesterday. My little dog is a... Uh, Kind of a nuisance. <laughs> and then when they just come and you know you've had a hard day and they'll come and they'll sit in your lap. I'm sure the big one even tries to, or they just give you that puppy dog eyes, as we say, and it just makes you feel a little bit better about the day and all the stresses that happened that day. That is the human animal bond. Mm -hmm. So not only it's mutually beneficial, is what we just what we say uh, the definition is mutually beneficial to both. So by your dog sitting in your lap or even the, the turtle, you know, the turtle's probably just in his own little world, mind his own business and you're just staring and you're watching him interact, you know, with his surroundings and things. And that in and of itself can bring your stress level from here to here. You do, your breathing probably slows down a little bit because you're just watching the turtle move around. And so then your tactical breathing can take your blood pressure from here to here. And then you having to walk your big dog all the time, that promotes heart health because both of you are getting out for exercise. And that's the human animal bond. So if our pets are doing all those things for us, 
then it's our job to do everything that we can to take care of them. And that's how the human animal bond works. So I started a nonprofit in order to communicate and show that and to show careers in animal industry, because I'm sure a lot of teens are like, I love, love, love working with animals, but Dr. Jones, I sure enough don't want to go to school or Dr. Wells, as long as you guys did, that's not in the cards for me, but I still want to be in that career. So there's so many different career opportunities that are out there. And my job is to hopefully expose youth to them and then develop some partnerships and things of that nature so that just like Andre here, you get to be do an internship or a shadow program and have that opportunity to see this in action. Cause right now it's quiet, right? Mm -hmm. So it looks all quiet and gentle and like, oh, this is what Dr. Jones does. But you don't see it when all the commotion happens, when the front desk, all the phones are, are, are full and ringing and ringing and the hit by car comes in, but yet you still have all six of these exam rooms full. And so I want you guys to see that so that you can say either I'm in it to win it, I'm in it, I see it, or you're like, that is not for me. What else is there for me, Dr. Jones? And that's what Pets Help the Heart Heal does. Mm -hmm. And so is your intern, Andre, part of Pets Help the Heart Heal? No, he just got back from college. So, but I will put him to work when we have our events. So we do have community events where youth can come in and see a day in the life of a veterinarian. We just did one a couple of weeks ago. And just like even with me joining a little bit later, so just like that day, a client called and needed a C-section and I had a house full of people here. Mm. And I was like, um, and I said to her, I said, well, if you don't mind 24 kids watching me do a C-section, I will be happy to do it. Otherwise I would have to refer to an emergency room. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. So it was an amazing opportunity, amazing experience for the kids that we had here. They got to see all of it. Wow. All of it. And my, my staff reviving the puppies, me doing the surgery and stitching up. They saw the blood. They saw all of it. Some of them did. Mm -hmm. And so then that worked because they, they could say, oh my gosh, I want to learn more. Or they're like, mommy, no, <laughs> I don't want to do this. So these are the little kittens. Oh, oh my goodness. So when she found them or when she brought them to me earlier, they were very healthy, but covered <laughs> in fleas. Okay. So she went ahead and bathed them. And then remember that fecal that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get a stool sample on them and look at it under the microscope to see if there are any worms. Okay. Because th honestly, this would be the one <laughs> that would have them. Yeah. And okay. so then she's going to try to foster them out once they're bigger. So how are you feeding them or how is she feeding them now? I think she actually, because they're four weeks, uh, most likely she just used a kitten food and then added probably their little milk replacer mm -hmm. um, or goat's milk, ironically enough, works really well. Okay. And then they did have um, some discharge from their eyes. So now she's going to put eye ointment in there because conjunctivitis is really common. Okay. In little kittens. Okay. And and how does Max like them? I see. Well, look, he look, he's trying to figure out what exactly. <laughs> I don't think he's seen a kitten before. Really? No. He's like, honestly, he's like, I'm good with kids. He is definitely staring. He's like, I don't know what that is and why do you have it? <laughs> but he's he's beautiful with kids. Uh-huh. Other dogs sometimes. Okay. But he loves people and he's trying to figure it out. That's amazing. There he is. Oh. Oh, is he licking? <laughs> That's a great photo opportunity. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now you can also see how tall he is. You see how yes. tall he is? He's, up yes. on the counter. he's almost as tall as you. <laughs> My goodness. And so tell us, um, because when we're talking about the human animal bond and we're talking about just how beneficial it is for this interaction. You have had the occasion to have kids go and read to dogs, right? 
Yes. Tell, tell us about so that. So we do reading with pets and we do reading with pets across the nation. So during COVID, I wanted to try to keep interacting with youth and keep promoting the human animal bond because especially during COVID when everybody was in their houses, I'm sure that was very stressful for a lot of people and a lot of kids. And so I'm a big, big promoter of literacy and the benefits of reading. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to do reading with pets. And so we were getting kids um, in different locations, different states, and they would read to pets in another state. And the fun thing about it was I would tell them, I was like, you never know what pet you would be reading to. Uh And so most of the times they are dogs or cats, but other times I've had an iguana, I've had a bearded dragon, I've had a miniature horse. And so the kids got to, and it's just 10 minutes a day. And so then you're practicing and I love, love it, especially even the virtual, because not only are you reading your favorite book, but you're practicing your pronunciation, Mm -hmm. you're practicing your speech, you know, basically speaking loud enough so that everyone can hear you. Um, And then we're finding some really great books out there and that's really great. And, um, And then they're also learning some fun facts about the different animals that are on there. And a lot of veterinarians have gotten on this bandwagon. And so they'll, they are happy to share. I had one, she was a large animal vet and I think uh, equine actually, so horses. Uh-huh. And they had just, the mare had just delivered a foal. So the foal was literally, I think 12, maybe 24 hours old. Okay. And so they got to see that in action as well. So you're learning, you're steadily learning and reading at the same time. Oh my goodness. And so how do you pick who, um, so as the kids are one thing, but how do you, do you, bleh, I'm just, I'm amazed. So do you get to see the animals as the kids are reading to them? Do you kiss, can you see their reactions? Yes. So we're, we're on zoom. We're just like this. Okay. So the kids are seeing the pets and Last one, it's all about the placement of the camera, which is amazing. And so, and then it goes Facebook Live so that other kids, and we just share, right? So other kids can see what's happening. So maybe they'll be like, hey, I want to read too. Uh And so, or parents are learning about animal care or the different animals that are on there. I think I see more adults sometimes on than I do kids, or you're doing it together. So it's a family thing. And Mm -hmm. for just 30 minutes on a Saturday, the first Saturday of each month, he's really intrigued with these kittens um, at 12 PM Eastern standard time. That's what we're doing. You meet on, you'll see pets help the heart heal on, um, on Facebook. Say the time again. It's 12 PM Eastern standard time. The first Saturday of each month, Facebook live. Okay. Oh gosh. So if you know of anyone who wants to read or if you know of anyone who has a pet that they want to show off because a, pet parents love to show off their pets. Uh-huh. So sometimes they'll be dressed up. Oh my gosh. And our holiday read. So in December, what we'll do is a group read. So we pick a book, a holiday book, and the kids get the book and then they'll get their assigned pages and we do a group read. And then we have different pets on and you get to dress up in whatever you represent in the holidays. So, um, and you get to dress up in your holiday pajamas. Oh my gosh. And it's a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. Devin, do you like to read? Yes, I like to read. Do you ever read to your pets? Mm-mm. Well, if I'm in the car and I'm reading a book and they're in there with me, I read it to them. Okay. Just, oh it's just good practice, you know. Sometimes we'll we'll scan through words when we're just reading to ourselves, but when you read out loud, there's many benefits to that as well. That he really is- likes the kittens. Oh my gosh! Right? He doesn't have a clue what that's about. <laughs> this is fantastic. So, Devin, would you like kids to read to your your pets? Um, I don't know. <laughs> But maybe if it was like a toddler or something. Absolutely. And that's what, I mean, most of the times it's like ages, what, seven, I think to 15 or seven to 12. Mm -hmm. That's usually who really wants to read, Mm -hmm. especially because like they're just trying to figure out, you know, the different pets. Somebody would probably love reading to your turtle. 
I think this is just so cool. And I'm always amazed to find um, kids who have reptiles. Um, you know, I never even dreamed of having any reptiles as pets when I was little, but I've met so many kids through YBI, through the Youth Veterinarian Initiative who have reptiles as pets. Yeah. And it's just, that's just amazing to me. And then, and then, and the spiders, like the tarantulas, I've seen that. That's a little scary, but to reach their own. Because I'm sure that tarantula is bringing them some joy. <laughs> and if that's what takes their stress level and anxiety level down, then sure enough, they need to watch their tarantula. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> God. So, Devin, do you have any other questions for Dr. Jones? Um, Are you thinking of becoming a veterinarian? Yes. All right. Very nice. And Devin is in Georgia, so he's the next state over. Oh my gosh. So Devin, do you watch Critter Fixers? Have you ever seen that show on Disney? No. Dr. Bernard Hodges is in the Georgia area. I'm not sure which area, but they're doing um, vet for a day all across the US. And so they're gonna be here in October. Nice. Sometimes I watch, uh, but God, it's something it's something with hell. It's I think it's called Hell's Cat or something. With what? And then uh the show with Caesar training dog. Oh yeah, Caesar Milan, I think. The the trainer, the dog trainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can get good tips all the time on just better pet care. And that's what's important. Mm -hmm. And so um Devin, might you have a question for Andre? Is it nice having to work there? He doesn't work here. I mean, uh, he just did his first year of college. And so, um, so we're, he's still, he's Yeah, I'm athlete. still kind of pretty fresh and new into everything, but it's definitely a good experience. You know, you always get to see something that you never really got to see times before. Cause you know, a lot of people don't really think about this job right on the top of their heads when they're trying to think about what they want to be when they grow up type of thing. And they kind of see what they see on TV, but they don't really know what the job really entails. So getting to really know what the job really entails is it's a good insight. Ooh. That is fantastic. And I mean, it's just, this whole program is so full of serendipity and I just can't believe that you have an, an intern who's a young man and we have this young man on this call and you have this one-on-one -on -one connection right here. This is just fab fabulous. Absolutely. It's meant to be. I think that, you know, things happen and exactly. people are where they need to be when they need to be there. Exactly. That. Exactly. All right. So we are at the top of the hour. This has been fantastic. Dr. Stephanie Jones, do you have any other questions for Devin? So Devin, so what grade are you in right now? I'm in eighth grade. Eighth. What's your favorite subject right now? Physical education. Physical education? Okay. All right. And then my other question is, what would be your, we call them spirit animals, but what animal best describes your personality? Best describes my personality. If you could pick. I uh, sometimes... Think about wolves or lions. Wolves or lions? Mm -hmm. And why would you pick that? I don't know. They just seem interesting. Yeah. I always say that too. I do like a tiger or something to that nature. They're strong willed. Mm -hmm. They're my very disciplined. Sign, my sign is a, a lion, but I don't think lions like that. Right. Just more about the personality or their nature or their environment. That's what I was thinking more of and what you can watch more. I have, since I have like a big cat as my sign, I looked into my Chinese at Zodiac sign and it's a rat. <laughs> and my, and cat, cats and rats don't really get it. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't quite mesh right. 
<laughs> How well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Allowing me to do my tour. Yes. And I hope you'll come back because we have all kinds of interesting things going on on YVI every other Saturday. Um, and I have to thank Dr. Stephanie Jones for just taking the time to show you, show us your beautiful, beautiful practice. It's huge. Oh my God. <laughs> and About 6, um, thousand square feet, I think. Yeah, that is amazing. And just sharing everything that you do. And you're the first person who's been on YBI that has talked about reproductive medicine. And you're the first person who's talked about the human animal bond. So these are new, you know, these are new inroads for us. And we're happy to, we were recording this and people will be able to see it later. And I'm just thrilled. And I, I definitely will be um, circling back to you when we are ready to talk about uh, camp. We're Absolutely. Not, yeah, we're not going to be doing camp this summer. There have been too many logistical things between COVID and then just, you know, supply chain problems and all. So we're going to do um, camp next summer. And so okay. now we have time to build up to it. And we're going to be building, reading into. Yes. Yes. So I'm just thrilled. It'll be a good hear. opportunity for me to make a trip. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we definitely are going to be wanting to talk to you about your um, reading, uh, reading to pets. And, and I, I just can't tell you how excited I am. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we're going to sign off now. I want to thank you again, Dr. Stephanie Jones, for being with us today. I want to thank Devin Elsko for being our special guest. I want to thank Andre. Andre, what's your last name? Mills. Andre Mills for assisting Dr. Jones and for speaking with Devin and sharing your, um, your experience working at the clinic. And we're gonna sign off now. Have a happy Saturday, everybody. Good weekend. And as soon as this recording has been rendered, I will be uploading it and we will send out the announcement so you can check out the replay. Thanks so much from YBI. Bye. Bye. Signing Have off from Karen. Bye-bye.